Hey guys, Veronica here, and today I want to talk just a little bit about seed saving. Now, we've covered some seed saving in the past with tomatoes and with lettuce, and there are a few other crops and methods that I just wanted to touch on really fast because as we get deeper into the season, this is something that is really important to keep in mind and could potentially be useful. So, hopefully I leave you with some tips that will help you out and help you navigate these waters. The first thing I wanted to mention are things like melons and pumpkins, summer squash, cucumbers, basically any seed that has that sort of gel membrane similar to tomatoes. I treat similar to tomatoes when I'm saving their seeds. So I'm looking to ferment that off, um, you know, for a couple of days just in water, and then I will rinse it and let them dry. Of course, scoop off any of the seeds that float and might not be as viable and then let the rest of the seeds dry and save them. Now, with other vegetables, it's kind of a case by case, but we'll go through what I'm saving and why so far this season. So the first thing is this flower corn, and I really, really like this corn a lot. Um, I definitely plan on growing it again, and so I really wanna save the first iteration of it that's been grown in this field so that it's starting to get used to the soil and get used to the conditions and climate that I'm growing it in. Now, this is a cob or an ear that I will save. And what I do when I go to save corn is I pull back the husks, I pull off all the silks, um, once I know that it's ready for saving and it's completely developed, and then I will let it dry on its cob for however long it needs. And then from there, I'll take the kernels off. Now, I'm not taking the kernels off of this one yet, because I'm not entirely sure that it's completely dry. I think it's getting close, but um, I'll show you with another ear that I'm not saving in that method. So these ones, um, this ear right here, is not actually an ear, it was the tassels, um, but it developed an ear of corn instead of tassels on this plant. I had a couple of plants that did that. I'm not going to save those cobs because they're basically, um, I don't know, it's kind of doing like a teosinte thing, you know, so it's regressing a little maybe um, due to stress or, you know, drought and climate and whatnot. Um, and it's producing kernels by any means necessary. So unless I wanted my next crop to try and favor that level of expression, which I don't know if it works that way, but I'm pretty, I'm thinking that it might, um, so which is why I'm not saving these kernels. But when I go to save, once something's completely dry, and that's why I grabbed one of these to show you, what I'll do is I'll just come through and pop off um, the kernels with my thumbs, just like that, and you'll know, whoops, you'll know because it's dry and they come off very easily and go flying across the room, so do it over a bowl. Um, another thing that you can do with corn, especially, is to just kind of give it a twisting back and forth if you're doing lots of it, especially if you're doing big ears. Um, that's a good, easy way to get all the kernels off quickly. Again, over a bowl or container, so don't go flying across the room. But that's how I'm going about saving corn. If you are not sure if the seed is very, very dry, then just keep letting it dry. <laughs> because the last thing that you want is a jar full of mold. Now you'll notice I have some beans here that I've been saving, and some of these are my land race beans that I grew this year. Um, I didn't plant that many because I wasn't sure what was gonna work in the field since I don't have the infrastructure in place, but I did wanna see you know, what could potentially work. And so my beans, even though I let them dry in the field, you can see I'm leaving the lids off and continuing to let them dry because I wanna make sure that they are completely dry before I put a top on them and then put them away for storage. I don't want them getting moldy. Now with beans, you could hypothetically um, let them dry, and you want to let them dry completely on the plant with beans and peas. Uh, let the entire pod dry and then pick it versus picking it early. You're going to get these really like shrivelly, underdeveloped beans and peas. Now you could save it in the pod just like this and then pop them open and plant them next year. I don't, and I'll show you why I don't. Um, I saved a couple, I think they're in here, to show you guys why I don't because one of the issues that we have with beans, and I haven't seen this to not be like a site specific, it's kind of a widespread, um, I did save, yeah, I saved a few. It's kind of a wider spread issue, whoops, 
is that you'll get bean weevils sometimes. And so if you see any pods when you're going to save that have, get in that jar, that have uh, like little drill holes in them, this guy's not a good example because it doesn't have any, but if you see any little holes in there, then you're going to want to pop open the pod and check. It's also a good way to see if those beans are even worth saving rather than having like a whole stash container. But you're gonna wanna pop it open and check, see like these black eyed peas, they didn't develop very well. Um, to make sure that there's not any little drill holes like that, because those are bean weevils, and sometimes they will just camp out in your beans, and then they'll eat your whole stash over the winter, even in a closed jar. So you wanna open them up once they're completely dry and pull out anything that has these little holes and check for smaller drill holes if you find beans that are missing um, corners and stuff that it looks like some, an apple something took a bite out of, like then check the other ones. And you're gonna wanna periodically check too with beans if you've found that, just to make sure there are no you know eggs that have hatched out in your beans and now they're eating all the rest of your saved seeds. Um, these guys, oh, they're not so bad. So that's the beans. I have some peppers here, as you may have noticed. And I have a couple different colors because I think that it's very important to mention the stage at which you should be saving your pepper seeds. Now, the biggest mistake I made when I started gardening was that I was saving peppers in this green phase. And the green phase doesn't work out because the seeds are not completely mature. Now, when you get into this sort of like in-between, right, this orange phase, these are all shishitas, by the way. So when you get into like this orange phase, you have a chance of some of the seeds being mature, but if you really want to save the seeds and make sure that they're viable for the next year, you're going to want to save them in a fully ripe phase. A lot of times that's like a red or orange, although there's some peppers that are brown, um, whatever the mature color is for that variety or the seeds that you're going to want to save. And I try to save ones from the earliest developing fruit of the season, just because I feel like that might give me a better chance of less days the following season. Um, kind of like the land race mentality, we're looking for you know, the biggest, fastest, strongest. So um, a lot of times I'll save, yeah, mostly from the beginning of the season, definitely when it's completely ripe. The end of the season ones, if you're ripening off plant, might be um, not quite as viable just because it wasn't ripened on the plant. But I don't know that for sure. So if you have ripened off plant and still got really viable seeds, let me know in the comments. I like to let the pepper, and this is one that I've crushed <laughs> I found in my car underneath the seat, I like to let them dry out completely like this, and then I'll pull the seeds out, and I have a few seeds here on the table. Um, and you can see they're completely dry, they are the right shade of tan, like those are more than likely viable even though they've been living in my car. Probably not viable for very long because they've been living in my car but they're not you know, super shriveled and, or they haven't turned you know, black or dark brown like the ones that are not um, fully mature tend to do. So that's what I do with peppers. Um, sometimes if it's a really thick walled pepper, I might either uh, cut the base off of it or cut a slit down the side like I've opened up these shishitos here just to let some air in because sometimes you'll find that the area around the cavity will get moldy. But most of the time, if you're able to kind of string them up and hang them somewhere that's not in direct light but has good airflow, they'll dry out decently. So that's how I deal with those guys. Um, you'll notice here that I have this big old cup of mustard seeds. This is my favorite frilly mustard. I've been growing it specifically for the seed. I like the flavor of the seed, but also the green's really nice. And uh, it's a long blooming, long standing, um, not a whole lot of greens when it goes to seeds. So it's not really a fire hazard like other mustards can be. And I don't find it to be crazy invasive, but I don't know because I'm always collecting the seeds. And so with things like mustard, arugula, um, basil, some of these smaller, um, smaller size seeds, what I'll do is, I'm gonna see if I can reach it. Yeah. I'll crush them in a bucket. And so I just pack them all. Um, and you'll see I've already pulled off like all of the stems on this guy. And so there's a little bit of chaff left here, but I crush them all in a bucket and just kind of strip all of the branches down. And then what I'll do is that's why I have this, let me move some stuff so you guys get a view. Um, that's why I have this bowl here is so that I can take this 
And I can just take the handfuls of the chaff with the seeds and not get mustard everywhere too, because we already have corn on the floor. Um, and then I just kind of shake it over this bowl here. And I'll just shake them out. And that will get, there'll be a little bit of chaff that falls through, but not nearly as much as there was in the bucket. And so then when that's done, like you can see, there's a little chaff on top. So that's pretty easy to pick out. And then I'll put it in my magical wooden bowls and one of the giant ones and swirl it around and blow off, you know, the rest of the chaff and dust. But it's a pretty significant amount of mustard seeds for not a lot of work. I just really let them dry. Oh, here, I have examples of that. Um, I really let these guys dry out. Move that there. Okay. Dry out completely or almost completely before I go to harvest them because it makes life so much easier. So we'll move this in here. This is the mustard. Pull these guys. Ooh, <laughs> seeds everywhere in here. I have to sweep after I'm done. Um, but so this is the mustard, and so you can see it's totally brown and dry. It basically it doesn't get irrigation. So when I decide to stop treating and watering various parts of the field is when those parts dry up. Um, and I hadn't been watering that much to be honest, but it's been really hot and dry. So the things that are spring vegetables have gone to seed now. And so when the mustard gets to this point, when you can easily break the stem. Um, and when you can easily, you know, twist and pop the seeds out of each little husk, that's when you know that you're ready to harvest. The same thing goes for stuff like quinoa. So this is nice and dry. And you'll see um, if I crumble it, then it all, all these little bits come out. And this one's definitely, it's more work in, in terms of harvesting because there's a ton of chaff but you're able to get it through something, I'm trying to think, this one's not fine enough, but if you have a much finer screen, sometimes that helps. Um, I usually will just go through and like, you know, really just grind it down with my fingers because it's not, um, it's not a spiky or rough plant. And so I'll just, while I'm watching TV or something, just be pushing through the quinoa seeds and then go outside and again, blow off the chaff and you should be good to go there. It's going in this jar which this is just a broadcast mix. I do all kinds of broadcast mix mixes um, for when I'm doing covers because um, as I'm amending and as I'm planting between plants, I don't want any open spaces on the soil. So I'd rather have something I can grab a handful of and mix in with my amendments or my top dressing than to have that open soil or have to like think really hard about what I'm gonna plant. I'll have like my spring, summer, winter, fall sort of broadcast mix where it's not cover crops and it's not um, you know, crops that I'm looking to plant, but it's kind of these fillers that produce lots of seeds and ha are very useful and don't take up a lot of space. So they get their own little spot in addition to saving them individually as the masses of their seeds come in. As you'll see, this is lettuce. Sometimes with the lettuces, if I don't have a ton of seeds, like this season I don't, what I'll do, and this is not a good example because I pulled the whole top off to show you, um, but what I'll do is I'll go in out in the field or in the garden and I'll just grab each of these as they open so that I can get those seeds and let the other ones continue developing. I might try and stick this in just like a vase of water to see if the other ones will open more still or not, but I'm not super worried because there are more coming in. I just don't have a ton. So when I'm low on the amount of seeds that I have, then I may let them all develop um, and go from there. There are, what else is in here? We got some basil. And so basil is a nice, um, consistent one. You want to get it, once you see these seed heads start to turn mostly brown, and you'll still have some green leaves on there. The foliage will be a little bit green still. But you'll see mostly brown on these seed heads. Then one of the things that we'll do is you go and you squeeze each one, and you'll see that as I squeeze and turn, and you could just crush these too, but if you're not doing a ton of them, it's an easy way to, without having to do like millions of minutes of extra cleaning. Um, as I squeeze and turn them, you'll see there's just all these little black seeds that pop out. And so you'll know that those are, oh, this smells great. It's lemon basil, I think. It's like pine salt. Um, you'll see them pop out very easily. And they should be mostly dry, but again, I'll leave those exposed to air for a few more days just to make sure that I'm not putting away something that's going to grow me some mold. Um, this is a monarda. It's a bee balm, one of the wild plants that grows here. Uh, you could 
use this for oregano or mint as far as the technique, but you have these like little bumps of um, what were flowers and now are seeds. Basically anywhere the plant produces flowers, for the most part with few exceptions, is where you're going to find the seeds, um, flowers or fruit. So if it's a fruiting plant, then it's going to be in the fruit, <laughs> generally. If it's flowering, then the seeds are going to come after the flowers are done. And so these guys, I just flip them upside down and then I roll the, um, the segments between my fingers. And their seeds, I'm trying to see, yeah, the seeds on these are really small. They actually look like dust. So another one I've got here are these zinnias. And you'll see the zinnia is pretty brown and crunchy and you want to wait for it to turn pretty brown. Um, whether you know you're deadheading or if you're just at the end of the season collecting the flowers and I wait until it's like this and then I pull all of the seeds off from this cone once it starts to cone up like that beans <laughs> once it starts to create a cone like that is usually when there's viable seeds that have developed and if you pick them too soon they're great for um, decorative flowers but you might not get seeds off of them I have another one here too that you can see they all pop out and then all of these little pieces there are going to be seeds. Now I probably, for the sake of demonstration, I'm showing you um, what they look like on the inside, but I'd probably let those seed heads dry completely before collecting these seeds just to um, let them finish essentially on the plant without it being like this kind of sticky mess. And they don't all seem like they were totally done um, getting whatever they needed from the seed head. So just something to keep in mind, like sometimes letting it dry in the pod, on the flower, on the cob, um, you know, completely is going to be best for you as far as um, that seed finishing its cycle before you save it. Um, one of the things, once your seeds are good and dry and ready to go, is what you store them in. And so I tend to favor mason jars. Uh, not always this big, but it's a nice vessel to keep seeds in because they are airtight and if you have the big ones then it's good for things like corn and beans, seeds that you're saving a lot of, especially if you're growing a volume of them and sharing them with friends and family and whoever. Um, mason jars are really good just like place to put those sorts of crops. I get them at the thrift store all the time for like a quarter or 50 cents a pop, which is way cheaper than if you're buying new cases. Uh, so keep your eyes peeled if you are thrift shopping. The other cool thing when you go to the thrift stores is you can get sweet jars like this. Um, so if you see something that looks like it has a mason sized lid, then pop the lid off of a mason jar nearby and test it out. And that's exactly what I did with these guys and I said, oh I really like these jars. I wish they made mason jars like this to be honest more often because I like that slimline profile. I feel like that would fit really well on a shelf. But again, a quarter of 50 cents. Um, I do a lot of... Oof, I do a lot of smaller seeds in the smaller mason jars. Occasionally I'll buy a case or two just to have them on hand. I've also used spice jars, so if you have um, spices that you've bought and you have those containers that you've saved, those are a great thing to use for seed saving and then you can just use a spice rack or a box or something. Of course, if you just have seed packs or envelopes or Ziplocs that you're using, then just keep them in some sort of container. These are shoe boxes that are not airtight, but they work, they do the job. Um, it's better to save seeds than not save seeds, so don't let the container stop you. One more thing I wanna mention before we go is if you decide, um, this is techniques to save for things that you don't think have cross-pollinated, so if you're growing one variety of something, um, that's a good way to know there's not cross-pollination happening. For the most part, you might have a neighbor growing a similar squash or melon, and there might be a little, but if you don't have multiples in your garden and you don't have to isolate, um, then you're able to save those seeds and potentially grow them true the following year. There's things I don't worry as much about, like tomatoes and lettuce and even peppers to some extent. I'm not selling seeds, so I'm not super worried about you know the less promiscuous flowers um, cross-pollinating things that have a male and female flower like pumpkins and squash there is more concern around that because there will be some cross-pollination um, also 
like this ambrosia melon here, hybrids. So if you're saving seeds from hybrids, just know you will not get anything that even closely resembles um, the parent plant that you've saved some from because those seeds are a cross of two other plants and it's a very intentional cross that gave you the plant that you worked with and decided to save from. That being said, if you want to do a really long, um, long-term project with hybrid seeds, then save the seeds from your hybrids and plant out a bunch of them and see if any of them taste good. If you have the space and you have the time, like go for it. But just know that if you're saving from something that's hybrid versus open pollinated, then you're not going to get um, necessarily the flavor or even the shapes <laughs> that you're looking for. So I think that was pretty much it. Um, I love seed saving because it's a great way for me to capture flavors that I've fallen in love with and want to continue experiencing. There's a tomato that I saved from a neighbor in Italy um, two years ago. And it's like, I'm not in Italy this summer, but I have this tomato planted and so maybe I'm gonna have a chance to taste it if all things go right out in the garden. <laughs> then I'll have you know, something that's similar to that experience. Um, obviously everything's not identical, but it gets close. And oh, the only other thing that I wanted to mention outside of that is that there are things like chard that take close to two seasons in the neighborhood of two seasons to go to seed. That being said, they're totally worth it um, and very uh, good things to save. So don't be afraid to deal with the biennial crops like carrots and chard and uh, beets and you know a lot of things in that space they will take longer but it's um i think it's worth it if you have a corner to dedicate to them if they're able to survive through you know the winter and put up seeds the following spring um yeah go for it so i think that's pretty much it for today i think this went on a lot longer than i expected it to um, if you have any more questions beyond that please leave them in the comments below as always, if you like what you see, um, hit that subscribe button wherever it is today and follow me on Instagram at Flavor Kit for all of these sorts of things and more as far as what's going on in my garden and where I'm at um, as far as the process at this point of year and throughout the year and throughout the seasons. So yeah, there's Instagram, subscribe, oh, Patreon at Veronica Flores. If you're not over there, we have a good time. Um, and until next time, happy gardening.